this whole thing started uh, because Chad and I were sitting at a table and we just thought uh, collaborative consumption has been so much in the news, so much of us are talking, we should do a panel about it. And uh, two months later, here we are. Um, and we are so lucky to have four of the key industry leaders that are shaping collaborative consumption. And before I get even started, uh, I just wanted to give a round of applause to Oric for organizing, for the panelists for being here, and obviously to all of you for being here. Uh, it's early in the morning, and I know quite a few of you had to drive, so a uh, big round of applause for that. <laughs> and hopefully I won't drop this folder multiple times. Um, so um, I just wanted to read very quickly. This folder has like all my information on people. I just wanted to read actually a very quick paragraph uh, on what Wikipedia at least has to say about collaborative consumption just to level set us. Uh, the term collaborative consumption is used to describe an economic model based on sharing, swapping, bartering, trading, or renting access to products as opposed to ownership. Technology and peer communities are enabling these old market behaviors to be reinvented in ways on a scale never before possible, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm sure many of you have come across the term. Uh, what we are hoping to do today is to hear from the different experiences of our panelists and to really debate collaborative consumption, why it's happening now, where it's going, what are the other trends that are possibly coming. And uh, before we go that route, I just wanted to introduce every single one of our panelists. Um, so first we have Victor from TaskRabbit. Uh, he, Victor has a career ranging from engineering to entrepreneurship. Uh, he is currently head of marketing at TaskRabbit. Um, he has also founded Frenting and DabNab. And um, before that, he was uh, at the Harvard Business School. He's also an avid triathlete with an ambitious stretch goal to never finish last. Uh, so is, far, I've won. This is your official bio, by the way. Yeah. Um, then we have, oh, I have in the wrong order. Then we have Avery. Unfortunately, your bio on LinkedIn doesn't have words. So um, all I know about Avery right now, and please feel free to add to this, is you're at UC Davis and you're head of product at GetAround. Uh, and GetAround, for those of you who don't know, it's peer-to-peer -peer share, <laughs> car sharing. Um, and then we have Tim from RentCycle. And... Tim is, I didn't realize Oric would actually give bios for everyone, so if you guys want to learn more, just read the little pieces of paper that you've been given. Uh, but Tim was uh, at Red Hat at one point, Cheskin, and he founded and is the CEO of RentCycle for the last three years. And before that, he was at Duke. Um, and finally, we have Mark uh, from Liquid Space and Nick. I, are you a triathlete, Mark? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it was really funny about it. I think about uh, 18 months ago, I ran into Tim on a triathlon course. And yeah, I was starting the run when he was crossing the finish line. <laughs> uh, so apparently, requirement for being a collaborative consumption entrepreneur, you have to be a triathlete. Um, so Mark's LinkedIn is way too big for me to go through. He have done way too much. But uh, I will suffice by saying that he... Thank you, thank you, pretty much. And he's been doing, look, uh, he is uh, the co-founder of Liquid Space, which allows you to share office space. And if you haven't tried, you should really try it, it's very cool. So uh, with that said, uh, let's get started on the panel itself. And uh, what we had done among the five of us and with the help of Oric is just brainstorm some key questions. Uh, so we'll use those to structure the discussion. And I'm hoping we can do that for about 45 minutes. Uh, and then for the next, 45 minutes, we can just entertain questions from the audience. So um, the first question that I have here is, uh, why collaborative consumption now? I mean, the model for collaborative consumption of sharing, bartering, trading, that has been there for quite a while. What is different that it's happening right now? And what I was really hoping is um, to really make this into a discussion. So uh, feel free to debate and get angry at each other. We won't, you know, we won't be. We will enjoy that. So uh, I'll, I'll leave to whoever one of you wants to, to get started. Um, I'll start because I'll use the obvious ones. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons why this is the time that collaborative consumption is really reaching a tipping point and starting to enter mainstream society. Um, I think factors such as the recession, 
um, people living more within their means, combined with the rising technology and the fact that mobile devices are so much more prevalent and location-based uh, technologies became prevalent at the same time as this like recession where people were living more within their means and looking for more opportunities to reconnect with the community around them. I think that provided almost like a perfect storm of like trends coming together to make a sharing economy where people want to be part of a community, where people want to, you know, use resources that already exist to live within their means and leverage technologies that didn't exist a few years ago. I think that's really opened up uh, and blown the top off of the opportunity for collaborative consumption to take off. But those are the obvious ones, so I just wanted to start with those. Uh, I'll follow up on that, because I think that's, that, that sort of represents 95% of why collaborative consumption is, is going well right now. Um, economic pressure has this, we were talking about this a little bit uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the networking session earlier, but collaborative, or economic downturns and economic pressure has this um, trend of creating a reliance on one's community around you. So if you don't have enough money, you are much more willing to sort of knock on your neighbor's door and ask to borrow a cup of sugar or something like that. And so there's, um, because you need, because uh, the, the trust and reliance on the people around you has increased in the last uh, few months, uh, companies like this and modes of operation like this become something that people are a little bit more uh, willing to engage in. So there's still an issue around trust. You know, if, if, if nobody wants for anything and, and economic, um, economic issues aren't a concern, then you, there's no need to put yourself at risk. And, and even if there's any sort of worry about should I trust an individual as a counterparty to a transaction, uh, it's just not something you're willing to engage in. But because you're in this, uh, in this sociological environment where people are almost forced to trust each other, this becomes a, a little bit more, uh, more of a frictionless mode of operation. So just following up in, in violent agreement that there's a cultural aspect that enabled it, there was a technology aspect, and there was an economic one. I think in certain, speaking from our vantage point on the asset class that we're focused on, which is real estate, maybe it's maybe this is an added component that, that is, from an economic stress standpoint, the old model actually broke. I mean, we just went in, we just, we're emerging now from a three-year nightmare where the commercial real estate model and the residential real estate model broke. Uh, they got completely out of whack, and so that was a violent reset. So from an economic stress standpoint, it was, look, we learned from that that we don't want to get into long-term fixed economic constraints around assets like that. So I think that's an added, added goose to this particular sector. I'm not sure if that applies to the other asset types. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that's the kind of the last major thing. There's corporate, you know, there was kind of major corporations making mistakes that resulted in, in collaborative consumption. Renting a car, you know, to use Getaround as an example, just isn't a good experience. And so people are figuring out ways to go around it and just basically do it themselves. And I also think that the reason the sharing economy is starting to take off in ways that it, it hasn't in, you know, even the last three years is because I believe that there's been like an evolution in consuming where, you know, technology, when the internet came into the picture, um, the way people consumed changed fundamentally. We went from buying things offline in brick and mortar stores to actually buying those same things online, uh, first through like a corporate entity that kind of oversaw the whole thing like Amazon. Then we moved to eBay where we were kind of exchanging and buying things between individuals. Um, Craigslist took it a step further where we were doing that exchange meeting online, facilitating it offline, but it was off for purchases. It was off for kind of you buy an asset from one person to the other and it's kind of like you own it until you pass it to the next person or you know, until the end of the life of that product. But I see collaborative consumption as an opportunity to take this, this path of consuming to a new level where it doesn't have to be a linear process anymore. Um, we can leverage the internet, we can leverage these communities to take that same asset and share it and give it more of a cyclical life cycle. Um, and to me, like starting a company where renting is the primary mode of commerce, it makes a lot of sense that you don't have to buy and own everything anymore. You can just access it when you need it. Um, and 
I think I'm totally biased because I live in this world every day, but it feels like the natural evolution of how society can consume in a sustainable way. Not like it's a radical new business model. Uh, you know, 50 years ago, airlines emerged as a more efficient way to use an expensive asset, a plane. You know, 20, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, semiconductor factories, which cost $300 million a piece to build, went from being owned by one entity to being shared assets. The hotel industry, these are all well-established sharing economies. What's so exciting now is that technology and cultural and business enablers and drivers are compelling us to go and drive it down to the consumer level and to make it efficient and realistic to liquidate or liquefy, if you will, or, or create liquidity around ever smaller assets in ever more personal ways down to an individual consumer. That's really the biggest paradigm shift, right, is that you're putting consumers on both sides of the transaction. Consumers inherently trust, well, I shouldn't say implicitly, but most of the time they, they trust businesses as a counterparty to a transaction because it's what they're comfortable with, right? I go online, I buy something from Amazon, that's, I expect to get that. If I rent something, I'm renting it from a business. I, I, there's some in, implicit reputation associated with that business. When you now introduce the, a consumer as a counterparty, it's just not, doesn't fit into the mental model of, of the last 25 years of how people interact um, with, uh, with transactions. And so there's going to be a little bit of time, and I think it, it, it's going to take a while for consumers around the globe to shift their mental paradigm to seeing that as a natural mode of operation. But this is just the beginning. So what we're seeing here in San Francisco is sort of the, the root of uh, collaborative consumption is the beginning of people starting to trust consumers as counterparties. I think there's a... I think there's a strong desire for personal interaction. You know, they're, they're, people are getting tired of, you know, sitting at your computer and ordering things through Amazon. You want to meet your neighbors. You know, you sit at home all day and, you know, you're in front of your computer, you buy things from the shop, but you don't actually get to meet the people around you. And so, you know, there's, there's, a, big, there's a big push by the consumers to get involved and to no longer have to, you know, interface through corporations, basically cut out the middleman as they see it. That's actually funny, the wanting to meet your neighbors piece. It's, it's not something people realize until after they do it. Uh, I remember when I first used TaskRabbit in the context of, I have a, do I want to go work here or not? Uh, I, people have this, almost this inherent distrust, like who's the person who I'm going to interact with? Is it somebody who, especially with all of the, the negative press that Craigslist has got, uh, with not, without having any of these security mechanisms in place, so I just wasn't sure I had this inherent distrust of who I was going inter to interact with on the other side. Uh, and when I, I posted a task and I had somebody come and deliver my groceries and found that it was a commercial airline pilot who was in his off week, he flies one week on, one week off, I started to realize, oh, wow, you know, neighbors are really cool people. And this is just somebody who lives down the street who I paid to go buy groceries for me. And, and it's really cool. You realize that by and large, the people who live around you who want to help you are awesome people. Yeah, and that's not, I, I really like Avery's comment there. It's not like that's a new human characteristic. I mean, arguably, if you went back to 1490, or, you know, 1500s colonies here in, on, you know, on the East Coast, I, I would imagine that uh, goods and services were all being shared freely without an economic, or, well, at least being shared, that was human nature. We, you know, the community was a natural desire of people. We're kind of getting back to the future now where the social and mobile and local aspects of technology are making it easy to reintroduce those sort of innate characteristics that we all have, the, the desire to get back in touch at a personal level and bringing it back into this really exciting kind of commerce field, which is asset sharing. Yeah, they say like using the internet to get off of the internet, you know, like connecting online to meet offline and actually engage with the community around you because you're right, this is not new. Like it's really not, it's just, it's, you know, kind of going back to the way that things used to happen using the internet as a new, um, point of meeting with your community. So um, what I'm hearing from all of you is all these different reasons for why collaborative consumption is happening now. But at the heart of it, what I'm, I'm hearing from all of you is, is the notion of trust, that there needs to be trust for the system to work. And now there's certain things that have happened that are allowing this trust to exist. Can you guys comment a little bit more on that? And what are the mechanisms that are allowing trust to exist um, and specifically tied a little bit with your own experience. I mean, all four of you are running key startups in the space, right? Like, how have you guys seen this in, within your own business? Um, I, I can take a stab at that. The, the advent of the social network, I think, was extremely important to actually bring in trust in the internet because people became comfortable with sharing, you know, large, you know, sometimes too much personal information about themselves 
and um, you know, with basically their entire online community. So now, you know, people have been able to figure out what, you know, what it what it is that they look for in someone, you know, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, that makes them someone who they trust, someone who they're you know they're willing to interact with. There's table stakes for the collaborative economy. There has to be uh, layers to it as well. There's a functional uh, control and trust issuance mechanism. Uh, there's a reputation layer. And as uh, Victor said, now it's a consumer to consumer exchange. So the supplier has to trust the buyer and the buyer has to trust the supplier. So it's got to flow back and forth. And both have to trust the platform. Absolutely. And then there has to be control. So if I extend trust as a supplier to a sharer, I need to have, and we, we contend in real time, I need to have the ability to take that trust away or take that, that authorization away if circumstances change. If, if someone violates the workspace that was transacted, I as the workspace share need to be able to have a, a real-time ability to control that, to bar access and bar entry, to prevent some of the high-profile bad things that have happened in some of the early days of this collaborative economy. Yeah, I, mean, I, I would echo that. I think the, the, the number one reason why TaskRabbit exists is because of uh, the trust mechanism that we have. I mean, if, if you eliminate trust entirely and you're really just talking about hiring people to do things, you're talking about Craigslist. And if, if people uh, were comfortable with hiring people off Craigslist, then people would do it on a day-to-day on -day basis. So TaskRabbit was built around the notion of background checking and vetting and interviewing and making screening and making sure that everybody who's a service provider on the platform uh, is somebody who is going to give you a, a good experience and someone who you can place your trust freely within. So I think that uh, because it's been... Uh, it, it's something that we've seen as a, uh, a linchpin, and you see all the messaging around the site when you come onto the, the homepage, you see trust and security is number one. Uh, that is what we've learned at TaskRabbit. I think that's what you're going to see is, is true with all the other startups, Airbnb, Get Around, Red Cycle, Liquid Space. Everybody in this space needs to be able to, to, to place their trust in, in all the members of the, of the platform. I can speak to just how much this matters in like creating a sharing economy type of website because um, rent cycle for those of you who don't know like most of well all of the rentals that happen on our website it's a business to consumer type of website so we bring rental businesses online there's 65,000 rental stores across the United States we bring them online to provide their inventory to the community of users uh, we do not have individuals posting you know, a uh, lawnmower out of their garage. It's all facilitated through businesses. And that was a, a move we had to make. I started the company as a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace for rental. And I really went down that path for a few months. And what I found was that, like, the issues of trust and liability were so huge when it comes to physical property, personal property, loaning that out to strangers and hoping you get it back. And there are... <laughs> There are great examples of companies that have solved that and kind of like been able to mitigate it. But for us, it was really like bringing the industry online solved a lot of those problems for us, so we went there first. So we kind of pivoted away from C to C and we moved to B to C so that all the inventory was handled by professionals um, who have contracts, they have insurance, um, they know how to handle liability. They do it for their job anyway without us, but we just help them do it online. Um, and we made that pivot because that, in our mind, was the best way of pulling off our strategy because in our world, in product rental, it all happens offline right now. There is no online product rental at all. So bringing the industry online who had an element of trust that individuals just don't was the first logical step. I mean, I definitely want to get to the place where we are C to C, but we had to start with B2C because of the trust issue and the fact that there are existing rating systems, whether it's Yelp, Angie's List, Better Business Bureau, um, all of these validators for businesses, that doesn't quite exist for consumers yet, especially to the point where it follows you wherever you go online. And I think that's going to be a, a, an area of growth around um, the sharing economy. Yeah, I mean... Get around is actually, you know, we're in that C to C space doing rentals, and the the big challenge for us was, you know, there there's an issue of trust between the owner and the renter when sharing a car. You know, we have people who share like Teslas. You know, it's 
incredibly expensive car, they hand someone their keys and say, you know, please bring my red sports car back. <laughs> but you know, what, what lets them do that is that they trust the platform, they trust us. And that was the big, that was the, you know, the big challenge for us. We, run, you know, we, had, we had to set up our system to run driver record checks in real time. We had to get a solid insurance policy so people knew that when they were renting out their car, they didn't have to worry about what happened. We had to build a solid customer support team so that people knew that, you know, just because you're insured, you know, I'm sure as anyone who's dealt with insurance knows, doesn't mean that you're not going to have hours of headaches, and people don't want that. So once we, we, we reached that point, then there was a basic peace of mind, kind of a baseline for trust on the platform, and then we could use things like ratings and reviews, messaging, social identity, to help owners take that last 10%. You know, make the final step. But the big challenge was first bringing trust to the platform and kind of establishing that baseline. And I think uh, we're finding that uh, trust is not a binary thing. It's not I trust you or I don't. There are degrees of trust. And at different levels of trust, I might be willing to extend varying levels of privilege to someone. So I, I could be Oric and I've got underutilized conference rooms in my building and I might decide that, you know, I, I'd like to make those available one hour a week during the lunch hour to the general public, uh, to, transactionally, to generate awareness. And if I'm a portfolio client of Oryx, maybe I'm willing to provide eight hours a day, nine to five, because there, there's a higher level of trust. We, we transact with them. And if it's a, a f you know, five-year habitual customer of Oryx, maybe, hey, we'll give you, we'll give you, you know, all that for free. So we'll, we'll add a, a price component to it. And if I'm an Oryx associate visiting from another region like New York, maybe I've got 24-7 unfettered free access. So trust is a function of the, the business situation, or the, the degree of trust is relevant to the business situation from a sharer standpoint, and also to the history and, and various other factors associated with who you might be sharing with. You know, an interesting piece of this that I keep hearing is that um, there's elements of trust, there's different dimensions of trust, some that are unique to the platform and others that, are, that could be considered common across the entire uh, industry. Um, and so obviously, just because somebody's a good handyman on TaskRab, it doesn't mean that they're going to be a good, safe driver on GetAround. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't um, infer some level of trust that uh, of an individual across all members, uh, across all platforms. And so one thing that I, would, I, I hope to see within this industry as, as, as this industry evolves and as the industry leaders sort of take the reins uh, is for uh, some, some information sharing between the, the companies. I don't know how exactly this works, but if you are a trustworthy member on one platform, there's an implication that you could be a trustworthy member on another platform. And I, and I, really, and I really do hope that there's, there's, a, there's more collaboration within the collaborative consumption um, uh, industry moving forward, that where th this just helps the industry evolve uh, and, and puts the, the, the public trust, it, it puts the public uh, perception at ease uh, when it comes to embracing a new paradigm. I think the companies that, you know, are the most successful in each of the verticals have really thought hard about how to deal with the trust issues that are universal and also the ones that are really specific to their business because, you know, the things that Avery mentioned around what GetAround's doing, how they establish, like, a relationship with Berkshire Hathaway to have insurance in place and how they did all their credit checks and, you know, they safeguarded all their payments that was really important. If if that was overlooked, you know, there have been companies that have kind of risen very quickly. Uh, last week, like, there was a luxury peer-to-peer -peer car rental company, High Gear, that was really, like, showing promise, growing really fast, uh, but overlooked some of the safeguards that Avery mentioned, and they had to close their doors because they were infiltrated by, you know, a criminal ring, and they lost $400,000 worth of merchandise, because they were doing luxury cars. And it's just an example, I think, of growing too fast and not considering the implications that trust really has. And it's more than just like, can I see your Facebook profile? It's kind of like safeguards at like the payment level, having kind of encryption and, and just a lot of deep and serious stuff that if you don't do it, then there's a huge risk in using the platform, and you may not get that trust back ever again. Red Tesla, criminal ring. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, so that, I mean, that, can I rent the Tesla? <laughs> Are you 30? <laughs> um, can, wait, there's a question already. How many of you have actuaries on the board? We do. We have a, um, 
a former Secret Service agent that consults for our security, uh, the security piece. Wow. Um, so, and, and, and about the high gear thing, it, it, I mean, that's what it comes down to. We spent, Get Around has been along for a long, around for a long time. I mean, we launched in January of 2000, uh, of, you know, 2011, but we'd been doing it for almost two years before that. And the reason it took so long is that we knew that, you know, that you have to, you, when you're dealing with people's cars, you are things they care about, and you have to build in, you know, the security and the safety. And so the biggest risk to collaborative consumption right now are collaborative consumption companies who disregard trust and try to rush in and create a, you know, just a completely open marketplace. Because right now, collaborative consumption companies are tied together, whether they like it or not. And you know, one company's misdoings, like when the Airbnb, when Airbnb had their host disaster, you know, that company's misdoings reflected incredibly poorly on the whole industry. So I mean, I think that speaks, that alone speaks very strongly for you know your idea of uh, sharing information, you know, b between the services. I, I completely agree. I mean, and to go back to the Craigslist analogy, like, how long does it take to, to cr basically create um, a website with Craigslist and pictures? Um, you could do it in a couple of days. And the reality is that there's a great many ventures out there right now that aren't much more than that. It's, uh, we'll choose a category that we think is interesting that's got sizzle, and uh, we'll create a listing site and we'll go out and curate some really interesting, sexy pictures, and we'll call ourselves part of the collaborative economy. And, and, but do nothing at these transactional levels in terms of security and trust, these things that we've all been investing multiple years in that are really important. So I think, Avery, as you pointed, the, the noise factor out there is one of the bigger challenges that we all have to push through. Well, let me connect a bunch of threads that you guys mentioned. Uh, six months ago, I was sitting right there, and uh, one of the panelists was uh, Nathan from Airbnb, and he was talking about um, how they thought about creating trust. And uh, despite all the problems they had, uh, their strategy was, we will seed the community really carefully, and we're going to monitor this community and be very, very explicit, especially in the beginning. And as the community grows, we are going to keep moderating it and let the community eventually self-moderate itself. Um, is that the key? Is that the only way of doing this? Or is, th is that even enough? Uh, how, how have you guys thought about it? I don't think self-policing is uh, the end-all, be-all. I think it's a critical component. Um, again, from our own experiences, one of the things that prevents some inappropriate tasks from getting done on TaskRab is the fact that the TaskRab community will flag them and pull them down. But um, without the vetting process of getting the right people on the TaskRab side of the network, Maybe you wouldn't have that level of um, uh, that, that level of vigilance in the in the community, but I, I think it's it's a, a an ingredient in the recipe of of a trust community. But as you saw from uh, the debacle that they that they had, um, it's by no means the end all be all of of how to create a, a platform that people can trust wholeheartedly. It's too much work to push onto your customers. It you know, I mean the whole reason the platform is here, the whole reason Airbnb is there, is to do that work. And when you put it on people, it's going to get dropped. They won't be able to do it as well. You know, to, for the case of get around, you know, if we asked our if we asked our owners to check the people's driver's licenses, they would have no idea if the driver's license was fake, stolen. You know, what the case may be. And so, uh, you know, y yes, it would be great if everyone was you know nice and good and the market self police. But all it takes is one person to ruin it. <coughs> and the the role of the company, the role of the platform, is to catch that one person is to you know, let the sharing, let the 99 people share as openly and as freely and as frictionlessly as possible, but make sure that one person never even gets close to the other 99. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. Like, it should be an element of, of any community. I think the mechanisms have to be in place to enable uh, the policing among community members. But you know, at the end of the day, like, we are the ones thinking about this this is our business and this is, we know the challenges and we should be making all the members feel so safe in that community that they don't even have to think about it. Um, and I think that's our role. Um, and if we're not doing that, then it really can get out of hand. And, and we, there will always be theft and fraud. So I think our posture has to be vigilant and we have to honor that this is a topic area, and maybe you're getting the sense that that really is very important, and there's work to do from a functionality standpoint, and from a branding standpoint, and from a customer service standpoint. 
And I think the Airbnb incident, incident last June was more than anything a PR lesson for them, a customer service lesson. I mean, the, the underlying bones of their platform may not have been all that sort of short of where they should have been, but they just they got exposed on some clumsy communications that I think Im implied a lot more than, or, or eroded a lot of trust there, but th so that was unfortunate, but presumably that's been amended. But I think uh, it's, it's never gonna go away. We're all gonna have leakage. We, we can't prevent it because uh, the other guys, the other side is gonna be equally vigilant looking for ways to exploit this just like people shoplift and people do fraud and so forth. So. By the way, the Airbnb owner who got his uh, car trashed shares his car and get around now, so, or his house <laughs> trashed. So, uh, you know, I guess, he, I guess he's still a little comfortable with collaborative consumption. <laughs> But to that point, um, we are talking a lot about uh, prevention as an element of safety and security and trust, when in reality, it, that's, that's half the equation, the other half of the equation is response. Because like you said, law of large numbers, something is going to happen. It's just statistically, it, it's going to happen. So how do you respond to something that, that, hurt, that happens? I have a question for you. How, how are the rabbits vetted? It's, uh, it, it changes over time, um, but it's it's really what we view as our key piece of fundamental competitive advantage. Uh, right now there's a four-step vetting process um, that involves a uh, security background check at the state, uh, local, uh, national, federal level um, across all, um, all sorts of different avenues. Um, but primarily there's an application that they have to fill out. And there's actually a lot of psychological um, stuff built into the application process that actually inherently weeds people out. It's, it's a fairly involved application. So you actually have to go out and you fill out answers to essay questions and what are your specialties and what do you like to do and whatnot. Uh, once the application is reviewed, we send them through a, a video interview process. That's It's as, as automated as we can get it, and so it's still cost effective for us. Um, but it is a fairly involved process. That the, the task rabbits have to be tech savvy enough to be able to answer questions on a video interview. Uh, we review the video interview. Uh, we'll, go, we'll send them through the background check. Uh, there's some other stuff that we do that, that we sort of keep... Uh, Keep secret and private, um, but uh, and then on the other end, if there's a if there's a need on the supply side for the, the particular skill sets of that application, then we'll approve the task rabbit. I mean, I I have to ask, like, do you really think that that's scalable? Like that that's going to I mean work throughout because I, just personally, that that's a really lot. Like I would never go through that application process to be. I mean, and, and maybe that's because I don't want to be a rabbit. Um, you know, that, that's what it might come down to. But do you, are there really that enough people that, that want to do that and have you know, that desire? Absolutely. I mean, we have, we have a waiting list of, of applications across the country. Um, so every time any sort of piece of press or publicity or any, any bit of marketing messaging goes out to, to attract uh, people on the demand side, we have just a ton of people who, who want to be task rabbits. And it's quite honestly our goal to approve as many people who want to be task rabbits who are qualified to be task rabbits as possible. I think it's situational. I mean, the, the, the task rabbit that I hire to come into my house to babysit my daughter, uh, I might expect and demand a different level of vetting than the uh, individual that I might uh, allow to use my workspace for uh, two hours in the middle of the afternoon on a Wednesday. Right? So. And, and as, like I said, we were evolving our vetting process, and I think that's definitely something that we want to look into as well, is different levels of vetting, particularly when you look at things like childcare. And that's obviously something where you really need to trust the individual who's coming in. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a use case that, that people use TaskRabbit for on a fairly frequent basis. And so we want to make sure that uh, people don't just see, you've been approved, but you are approved and you're, good, uh, and, and you're approved for childcare. Uh, we don't provide detailed feedback if we re reject an application. I mean, we're sort of a, we reserve the right to reject applications if we need to, but, um, you know, we reject a, a, a not insignificant percentage of applications that come through. I mean, it's small. Uh, quite frankly, if, if you are diligent enough to go through that whole process, turns out, on average, you, you will pass the qualification process that, that we'll send you through. But, but that means, again, because the application process is so involved, it usually involves people that know what the rejection criteria are, and therefore, they'll just stop halfway through if they don't think they're going to make it through. And for us, it happens at two levels. Um, 
anybody can join Liquid Space as a user. And, uh, and we have the opportunity to reject them or turn them away for bad behavior. Um, venues or the suppliers at an individ individual transaction level have the option of accepting a request to share, right? And so, they, so the vetting happens at two levels. We try to push, from a scalability standpoint, we want to push that trust mechanism down to the sharer and empower them to have control and to give them the ability to get a good, clear picture of who they're sharing with. And, and, and so, because we think that's intrinsically more scalable. I mean, we, we err very heavily on the side of caution. So, you know, our, our fraud detection algorithms do sometimes, you know, fire false positives. But because trust in a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace is two ways, it's between the owner and the renter, and they both have questions about trusting the other person, they're actually, because, you know, we reject old cars, we reject cars with high mileage, um, we reject renters with bad driving history, and people who get rejected or people who are told, you know, oh, you, you triggered our fraud detection, you need to send us your driver's license or whatever, understand that that work is necessary because they're partaking in a marketplace based on trust. They have their own trust issues, so there, there's not a huge amount of pushback. And the way it works with RentCycle is when um, the evaluation is mostly on the businesses joining the system, and when they join, um, there are a lot of uh, existing systems that we can kind of vet them on, whether it's Yelp or the Better Business Bureau um, or other kind of small business checks that we can do. Um, and at that point, it's up to really the, the way they service customers. And we kind of have like a two strikes, you're out policy where, you know, if, if there's an issue on the servicing of a customer for a rental, um, you know, after, if there's a problem once, we, we have a serious conversation with them. I mean, we're very like, we call them up and we talk to them. If it happens again, then they're off the system. So um, my next question was going to be about hurdles, but I think between secret service, rejections, fraud, I think we have talked a lot about challenges. <laughs> so um, I was wondering if you guys can talk uh, a little bit about the trends that you're seeing. So we, we are at a, uh, relatively early stage of the development of collaborative consumption as an industry. Where do you see this going? Uh, and, and there are people out there, and if you Google for this, you can see it, uh, that claim that collaborative consumption is the biggest revolution since the Industrial Revolution. That may be a little bit too much, but uh, it, is, it is something that's fundamentally changing how we operate within society. Like, what is, what is going to continue happening down the road? I think you're going to see a uh, continuing trend toward more liquidity, so more assets uh, in these collective marketplaces. I think that's going to explode exponentially. Um, I think you're going to see, at least in our category, we're seeing it's not just consumers as individuals that are becoming participants in the collaborative economy on both sides, but it's also now organizations. So for us, you know, workspace is the second largest expense for every company on the planet after people. Uh, it's a massive carbon footprint. It's a long-term fixed asset that in some cases can force companies to fail for no other reason that they couldn't get out from underneath it. So it's, so, and, and, they're all, and corporations are also still the largest employers. We're moving toward freelancers. That's gonna, another trend. But, but now think about companies with 100,000 employees becoming participants in a collaborative economy, either supplying vast amounts of asset to be shared or supplying vast amounts of users because they prescribe collaborative consumption to their employees. Hey, Mark, um, you don't have an office anymore, but here is a tool that you can use to access workspace. Or you don't get a, a company car anymore or a car stipend. Here's a membership at GetAround. Right, so I think that that move of corporations toward collaborative consumption is going to be an enormous driver. And that, that's one of many things happening, but that's sort of a, a near intermediate term phenomena that we see happening. I kind of want to build on that because I think one of the, the things I'm starting to see and I can see happening more is the line is being blurred between an individual and a business. I think uh, this is happening in a lot of these communities. There's like, you know, the prosumers. It's kind of like the hybrid between like a professional and a consumer. Um, we have rental businesses on RentCycle that, you know, they might book out bouncy castles on the weekend, but the owner of the bouncy castle store doesn't even have a storefront. They just have a listing on RentCycle, and they do this on weekends kind of as a side gig. And I'm seeing the blurring line between consumer 
and business in that like I started the company as like consumer to consumer. We moved to business to consumer. We're actually doing kind of business to business at the moment. Like we're we're bringing professional rental stores that have the inventory, connecting them with like the wedding planner or the general contractor building a project or the hotel concierge booking, you know, an excursion for their guests. But I see the line between the individual and the business blurring a lot more in the, you know, the next year. Um, like task rabbits, news on the skill slate, acquisition, like I think that takes them into B to C a little more. And I don't think it has to be C to C versus B to C. Um, I think we're talking about the same thing. It's there are idle assets, there's people who want to use those assets, and they're being connected. Um, so I think it's going to become much less about where the asset is coming from and just more about the system that is enabling it. Yeah, I'm, 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 what I'm hoping to see, I don't, I don't know if this is necessarily uh, six months to a year out, but what I'm hoping to see eventually is an infrastructure um, development process that will uh, more easily allow uh, the use of underutilized assets. Uh, you know, the we talk about the kind of stuff that you're talking about is a $100,000 rental order. You know, a, a, an office to engage in a uh, in a transaction where you're renting out an office space doesn't really require much effort on your part, but it involves you know a sizable enough economic transaction. Uh, Steve Case was on Stephen Colbert the other night and was talking about the sharing economy in Zipcar, and Stephen Colbert invented a company called the to Toaster, or, or, uh, where you check out a toaster, and like that seems absurd, right? Like I'm not going to spend five dollars to go check out a toaster from a communal pool, and then use a toaster in the yeah exactly right <laughs> exactly. Um, but you know down the road, it, the 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 fundamental truth though is I do use my toaster for five minutes a day, so I don't know how that problem gets solved. But at some point, the economic value of a transaction to lend out my power drill or to rent a, rent a toaster from somebody, just today isn't, there's, there's no processes, there's no procedures, there's no infrastructure in place that would make me want to engage in that kind of a transaction. But if we really sort of look at the end all be all of what the collaborative consumption world can be, it's a world where transactions like that can be easily facilitated. And, and you do see uh, underutilized assets sort of approach that 100% utilization mark. More happy people using less stuff with a happier planet. Exactly. Um, actually, this might be a great segue. It's 9.10, so uh, let's, we might as well open it up for the audience. So I, I saw one hand lifted over there. Um, yeah. so yeah. Can you speak up, please? Do we have an extra microphone? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so it seems to me that you are each uh, democratizing the economy more. So if you see the economy as a big piece of pie, each person in your system is getting more than if he wasn't or she wasn't in your system. And to make it work, of course, you need trust, but that's the main thing you are each doing. And I'm wondering how you apply that model to the financial sector um, because um, the spaces you are is by itself already down. And if you go higher up into organizations that have a lot of monopoly and a big piece of pie, how do you make it work? Do people trust the financial sector anymore? I don't know. <laughs> I still trust Berkshire. <laughs> well, so you mean, are you asking specifically about financial services as a market segment to address, or...? Collaborative consumption isn't actually, I mean, there, collaborative consumption isn't for everyone. Um, I, I think the interesting uh, thing that we're going to see is where it stops. I mean, uh, uh, like, obviously, you know, you don't want to share, you know, I, I, like, when I wake up in the morning, I want a cup of coffee. I don't have to go rent my, you know, my, my, neighbor, my neighbor's coffee machine. <laughs> It, it just doesn't. My neighbor work. has a pretty awesome coffee machine. I that, that might be, but you know, it still doesn't work for me. You know, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go rent towels when I need to shower. So what's going to be interesting is where the line stops. You know, there's there is inarguably collaborative consumption is not sharing. It's collaborative consumption, and that means that there's a piece of the puzzle that has to be yours. It's ha that's what the thing. You know, that's that. 
that's what it's predicated on. And so as we shift to this access economy, what's going to be interesting is, you know, what remains things that people keep. And I think, you know, finance is going to stay one of those things that you keep, you know, that, that, that does not become collaborative because, I, you know, I, I don't see a way that it can. <laughs> exactly. We, we tried that. I think, um, like, I think, are you, are you getting at the fact that, like, basically less, um, there will be less production of things, right? So right now, if, if we're in a period of mass consumption, there's a lot of production happening, which means, like, a lot of goods are being produced, which goods have value. And we're talking about producing less goods, right? So you're wondering how, how does that work if we're actually producing less goods? How is the value going to actually go up? And the way, if that's your question, the way I think about it is um, in terms of like utilization, I think all of our companies are talking about utilization um, and utilizing idle assets, things that are just kind of sitting dormant, not making any money. And the premise would be to take less things and bring more utilization to those things so that over time, that one thing produces so much more exponential value than it once did because it's getting used by so many more people. I think if, um, this is a side comment, but just if back to sort of a macro trend here, if there's a tip that's happening, this is a tip toward, call it the intention-based economy or a consumer-driven economy rather than supply-driven. Where, where, you know, we got into a supply-driven bubble because capital was cheap. And, uh, and there weren't any restrictions being put on making more stuff, whether it was houses or buildings or strip malls or what have you, or, or cars and planes and so forth. So um, hopefully where we're trending to as a planet is consumer driven. It's, consumer gets more choice. We have to build less stuff. It's economically more efficient. There's just abundant good to that. But that's a pretty massive shift. We've been in a supply driven economy for the last 100 years. And I mean, wa waste has essentially been equated to wealth. You know, the amount of waste you produce is in, has been indicative of, of your wealth. You know, you buy, you don't need four cars, but you buy them to, you know, show that you have them. To write them out and get around. <laughs> that, that works for me. But, um, <laughs> um, you know, that, that, that shift away from waste to, you know, just taking things you need when you want them is a really great shift for us to be having as, you know, a society. Um. I'll probably mess this up in giving to people, so please feel free to collaborate and help me out if you see somebody who's being left out. But I saw a hand way in the back there. Hi. Uh, we heard a lot about how you guys are trying to uh, create this uh, industry that is rapidly growing and all the different threats. But I'd like to hear each of your views regarding regulation. Uh, both self-regulation as well as regulation from the government. And two things come to mind. Was, one was Airbnb, one was Uber. And I guess the question is, are these um, regulations designed to protect consumers or are they designed to kind of protect incumbent franchises that feel like they're being disrupted? Finance and regulation, off to a good start. <laughs> right on the third firm, rails right? we promise not to touch. <laughs> Well, I think in the Uber and Airbnb examples, I'm, I'm, I'm loosely familiar with them running up against uh, influence and leverage from existing franchises being threatened, whether it's taxi guilds and, or unions in New York City or, or the like. So I think um, um, certainly I take an open market um, uh, sort of overall sort of political stance on this. Um, I, I, so the role of so we so we want to we've talked a lot about trust. We want to protect the consumer and make sure that they don't get exposed to new types of fraud in these new market mechanisms that we're deploying. Um, but I think the opportunity would be for government to be involved uh, to make sure that this more sustainable, economically efficient economy is allowed to grow without being constrained by existing franchises exerting undue leverage. But I, which is probably unavoidable because they're a big part of the political process. I mean there. Um there's, uh, I don't know if you've heard of AB 1871. It's a bill that was passed that we lobbied very hard for that is, you know, was labeled the car sharing bill. And um, in it, we baked, you know, it's, it's, live, it's in California right now, and, and we worked hard to bake in a lot of consumer protections that mean that not only our company, but any other peer-to-peer -peer car sharing company is regulated to the point where the consumer won't essentially be left out to dry. So we must match your insurance policies by three times. You know, we have a set of, we have a set of regulations that exist. In the case of Uber and Airbnb, 
it's not as clear whether those regulations were created to protect the consumer or protect the industry which those companies are trying to disrupt. And I think that anything that hampers the growth of this economy, anything that protects the old industry, is a bad regulation. But on the flip side of that, any regulation that protects the consumer is good. And where it gets tricky is where that line blurs. I think we all start from the premise that the products and services that we're offering, that we're helping people, uh, that, that we're helping connect people to, to achieve um, are valuable. And people want to engage in those kinds of things. So regulation shouldn't stand in the way of people uh, engaging in transactions that they want to engage in. So regulations that do exist, which, I mean, again, we're in a nascent market right now, so a lot don't exist. But when they do, they should be put in place to protect the members of the platform, not protect, like I, I thought that was very well stated, not protect the existing industries that, that we're trying to disrupt. Actually, there's another big piece of this too, which is the financial issue. Um, and right now, especially when we talk about collaborative consuming of, of, uh, of goods, uh, the government derives uh, a fair amount of tax revenue based on the sale of those goods and sales tax and whatnot. So what happens when you have this informal economy <laughs> That, uh, that burgeons as a result of borrowing and lending and, and renting of, of time and, and services and, and, um, uh, and goods and whatnot. Uh, there was a, a blog article published by Harvard the other day that, that sized, unofficially sized the informal economy at $10 trillion. And if this only grows, what does that do for the traditional quote unquote economic strength of a government? And you know, how, do we, how do we play in that? That's gonna be an interesting uh, question to see how, how this evolves. Hello. I have a question about um, the fraudulent transactions that each of you sees and um, you know how do you provide for that liability wise or cost wise and also I don't know if you've discussed your economic models like you, you certainly take a percentage of the transactions I'm assuming so how does that all balance out in terms of uh, you know the amount you spend on protecting yourselves and the users of your platform and so forth versus the percentage you take and so forth. So each of you have a little different model, and I'm just curious about the economics behind all of your models. Thank you. Yeah, so we, you're right, we take a small percentage of, the, of each transaction. Uh, you know, as we sort of stated earlier, trust and safety is, is paramount to our, our offering, and so we bake in a lot of protections that, in theory, mitigate the economic impact uh, the, on the unit economics basis, like what each transaction will incur on a weighted average if you just amortize fraud across all of our transactions. Fraud will happen, but the goal is to, um, to theoretic, to, to iterate uh, on patterns that you identify. Uh, so, I mean, you know, we're, we're not building a business model that will fail under, and if, if you really sort of apply the, 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 the true costs of, of each transaction. Um, but as we go on, we will identify patterns, and I'm, I'm sure that's true for all of us. We, you just look and you identify the fraudulent patterns. You put policies and procedures in place to protect yourself against those. And in the cases where fraud does occur and something bad does happen, because it is inevitable that you know someone will get through, um, you know we have, you have to have procedures and policies and procedures in place to help the owner or help the you know person sharing their goods or whoever is the victim, essentially. And so, you know, with Get Around, if anything happens to your car, if it gets in a little fender bender, we'll give you a new car right away. You know, we'll make sure that there's no gap time between when your car is in the shop and, you know, when you actually need to, when you need to be able to use your car. And th that protection, you know, that's what allows us to take our percentage, which is 40%, by the way, um, of, every of every transaction, because owners know that we're actually providing value, that we're providing an insurance policy, we're providing anti-fraud, we're providing 24-7 roadside assistance, whatever it may be, you know, we're adding value. And so, honestly, the majority of our percentage goes towards, goes back into the platform. It goes towards adding value. We take a small cut to, you know, keep the lights on, but the goal is to grow the platform. So um, the fraud detection we wrote ourselves. Um, it's, you know, I can't go into all the details, um, but one of the issues and one of the failings with other peer-to-peer -peer car sharing companies is that asking for a driver's license and credit card is simply not enough. People, you can, you know, if I steal your wallet, I now have your driver's license and credit card. Um, so uh, to answer the insurance question, we're backed by uh, Berkshire Hathaway, and uh, we have a million dollar A++ rated policy with them, and they underwrite it directly.
So I have a question actually for everyone except Mark. Sorry, Mark. Um, for uh, those of you in, in the B2C space, do you have any way of detecting if some of your customers are actually very small businesses that might look similar to consumers? And do you see that being a growing segment? Yeah, I mean, for sure. That That's actually, you know, why I mentioned earlier, I think that's what we're going to see in the next couple of years is that blurring line. Because the image you can portray online as a business, like, I think you can always appear larger than you are, and you can always appear if you put pretty pictures up and you have a nice looking website. Um, and building Rent Cycle has been pretty interesting just because when we get deep with some of these businesses, we find out that they're really just people um, operating a business on the side. Um, some of them operate as their primary business. Some people operate as a side business. Some people, you know, do it just out of their homes. Um, and and it is like really boring because we went with businesses because they have insurance contracts um, and liability coverage. Um, so those are our requirements for what a business is. But in many cases, an individual will act as a business, and as long as they have those things, then we let them in. I mean, Gateron is interesting because it's two way, and I, you know, every one of our corners is a business. You know, they they set the price for their car, their availability. Many of them will market it themselves. They write you know descriptions to try to you know make the car better. Um, there's owners we have who've taken that to the extreme and have bought, you know, several cars which they brand, you know, we had a guy in Mountain View buy smart cars and wrap them in our branding before we even knew about it. You know, just because he was basically creating his own zip car where he owned the fleet except through our platform providing it. Um, so everyone really is a business from that perspective. The interesting trend I've seen actually has been in um, a, lot of our, a lot of our talks with actual corporations and businesses where they want to appear more like an ent like, a, like a person, like an entity. So they, they will make a Facebook profile and sign up their car under it because they want to appear you know, like they're part of the community. They don't want to appear you know, disconnected like a corporation. And collaborative consumption is a way for people to start businesses in a much more lean way. Uh, sort of what, uh, and going back to the point of, sort of the line blurring between what, what a business and an individual are, uh, you know, what Google did for small business advertising was make it accessible to effectively everybody. What Amazon fulfillment, what eBay did for uh, for for small business supply chain, uh, made it accessible for anybody to effectively now create sort of a world class logistical uh, operation. And what TaskRabbit is doing for labor is the same kind of thing. Like you, as a as somebody with an idea, can now advertise your business on uh, on Google. You can sell product through eBay, and you can hire a labor force through through TaskRabbit. Again, make it everything a pure variable cost. Well, my question was actually oriented to the That's kind of what I'm talking about. The the so in other words, if you are a um, you know, we have a, a great example of a, of a cupcake shop in San Francisco that uh, th there's, there's the two quintessential opposite examples. There's one that bought the van and hired people, and they do all their deliveries through their own branded infrastructure, and they've paid lots of money for all of this. And the other one, which uses TaskRabbit for all of their deliveries. And so they, they just they use TaskRabbit as a variable cost adder to each and every single one of their transactions that involves delivery as opposed to worrying about, am I going to get enough delivery? Am I going to have to do I, how do I amortize this capital expenditure across, uh, across my entire product line? So what's that? Uh, Susie Cakes is, is the other one. that, uh, and, and they're based in a couple of our, our geographies um, where we operate. And you know, they're building their delivery business on top, of, on top of TaskRabbit. And so we see that as just one example of, uh, uh, of the way businesses can use TaskRabbit as a way to um, either deliver a product or service uh, more effectively. I mentioned this earlier, but you know, we moved from C to C to P to C, or no, C to C to B to C. And now we're kind of moving to B2B to, B to C because there are professional renters that are transacting more than we ever expected, um, whether they're like construction professionals or event planners or you know travel agents. Um, we're, we're leveraging that professional group, which is kind of nice because they're well-formed, they're very organized, easy to reach out to. So on both the supply and the demand side for renting, um, those business professional systems are in place. We're kind of using that as a way to get into the consumer realm, though. Um, that's like ultimately our goal. So we're we're using every way we can to make 
renting of products happen with regular Joes? So my question goes to the early days of building a collaborative consumption business. Uh, you know, you have to reach critical mass of buyers and sellers and attract, you know, both sides of the platform without either wasting assets or, you know, wasting people's time without any demand. And I'm curious how you approach that problem and also what milestones started to suggest to you that you were on the right track with that approach. It, it's, a, it's a very difficult problem. I don't think anyone has figured out the formula. Um, but one thing I think any, everyone up here can attest to is that this is a very different way of, of thinking for people. Like the, the mental model of engaging in a, in a collaborative consumption transaction is different than the mental model of engaging in a transaction with, say, Amazon.com, you know, where it's just a tradi traditional buyer and seller relationship. Um, and as a, the way that you get people to shift their mentality a little bit, it, you can't do that through traditional advertising and traditional marketing. You know, you're not going to convince somebody in five words in an AdWords ad. Uh, on top of that, there's a very local component to this as well. So you can't just advertise nationally and get around is based in San Francisco and Portland. And uh, there, there's, a, there's a very, and TaskRabbit is based in a, in a handful of geographies as well. You can't just blanket the entire country with messaging. So what we found is you really have to tell a story. Collaborative consumption is, uh, because it's a new way of thinking, you have to tell that story to the individual in order to, for it to resonate with them. And so what are the best mechanisms for uh, storytelling? And it's primarily, it turns out, PR and word of mouth. Uh, when people have good experiences in their platform, they go and tell their friends. When they read about your company in, uh, in a publication they trust, they see the use cases and they start thinking about how they can use, use, uh, use your platform themselves. Uh, but traditional marketing, you kind of have to throw that out the window. <laughs> it's, it's just not going to work. Um, you know, in terms of milestones, it, it, you know, there's, again, there's no formula. You just sort of continue hoping that your business tracks according to your forecast and, uh, and that your investors keep giving you money. So um, it's a little different for GetAround. I mean, so the, it's a different space, and yet the demands and expectations of the consumer are the same as car rental. So when you rent a car, you need to get there. You need to give somewhere you're going. And if the car isn't there, if there's no cars available, you're not going to use the service. So we found that supply drives demand very heavily. And um, we, in the early days, were able to augment our, supp our supply by slightly fudging the model. So we had people who were leaving on vacation for three months, and they just had nothing to do with their car. So we would manage the car for them and you know, basically create some supply. That in conjunction with word of mouth, PR, and then owner empowerment, really treating them as a business, allowing them to, you know, we, we, we experimented with magnets, giving out cards, allowing them to self-promote in really dense, tight clusters, because all of, these, all of these collaborative consumption economies are very local. And so we, we really focused on cluster marketing, some through our own efforts, but also through empowering you know, the people on our platform. You know, spreading, spreading get around is, some, is actually something that can be done purely by the consumers. You know, we don't need to take a role in it. I'd concur with Avery that um, for us what we're finding is uh, we chose a region, uh, and, and we've now gone very broad, but we chose a region at the early stage and focused on empowering the supplier, right? Giving them tools and also advocating them to take an active stance. So give them mechanisms through which they can, in a social and mobile and a local way, reach out and engage their existing contacts and customers. So use this new mechanism to, to drive transactions. And then also ignite the sort of second order and third order connections that all of those first order users have. So, so you're focusing on the supply. Uh, we, we found that, that connection. And, and, and mentally, you want them to be actively engaged rather than supply saying, all right, I'm here. I'm just going to sit back and wait for the demand to come. You want them to go out and sort of pull the demand in to, to the extent that you can. And I think your question is like almost as much uh, like marketplace, how do you build a marketplace question than like how do you build a collaborative consumption company? Because it's chicken and egg, it's you know, supply and demand, which you bring in first. And there's definitely great examples of, of both ways. Um, the way we've gone is supply has kind of led the demand. Um, but I think you can look at companies like Yelp and like Grubhub who have kind of done it the opposite way where they brought traffic and then they were able to sell that traffic to businesses to buy um, something. But with, with Rent Cycle, for, for us, we had the luxury of working with rental businesses and like any given rental shop has like 3,000 SKUs in their inventory where one person might have like five things they might put on Rent Cycle. So that was, the fact that they weren't online was like a blessing for us because it gave us like, 
quick supply, which then we were able to bring like demand faster than we would have if we were trying to build this with individuals, which I think is a lot harder, and I have a lot of respect for my peers up here. So it's interesting, right? The, the industry is growing so fast, and you've obviously, you've obviously hit on um, very important trends. I, I like, kind of like to know what the end game looks like. I mean, you look kind of like web hosting in the 90s, where suddenly everybody realized that all of these servers were going unutilized for all this time. And they started with co-location, and there was an explosion of startups. And then it all consolidated with Amazon, and you rent servers by the hour at pennies per hour, right? So I think what's happening with the consolidation and consumerization of capital, what do you see the end game as once you've unlocked all the value from this, unlock, from this unused asset classes? Toaster. -er. Yeah. <laughs> I'm renting your toaster this week. Uh, <laughs> Toasters. It is, it is basically cloud computing with real goods. It's, it's usage-based, you know, it's, it's access-based you know, usage. So whenever you want a good, you don't, you don't own it you know, per se, but you access it. That at least is the goal with Getaround. You know, every car is rentable. And peop, you know, there's one person who may take the responsibility of maintaining it and you know, watching the car, but really they could rent any car on the street and rent their car out equally. Servers have those activity monitors. You know, so Amazon's goal was to take every server in their in their pool and put that activity monitor as close to 100% as possible and capture economic value at each little tick point on that percentage meter. I think the exactly what Avery was saying, we're, we want to see that activity monitor for physical goods approach 100% as well and for economic value to be uh, transferred for every tick mark. What does that look like in terms of a particular asset class like ours? That means no new buildings. We, we don't need any more commercial workspace in North America for the rest of our careers. The current latent inventory would serve it, period. So is that going to become the incentive for capital owners in general? Is part of being a responsible capital owner is ensuring 100% usage? It sort of depends on what your priorities are. I mean, if, if you personally like to own stuff and like to only use your own stuff, then, then no. Like Avery was saying before, collaborative, cons collaborative consumption isn't for everybody. And there's, not, there's no notion of social responsibility. Uh, as a way to pressure people to participate in the marketplace. But I mean, you know, you're, you're the, kind of, sorry. Uh, the, like the, the, the SETI at home, you know, the, the you know, loan your computing to finding aliens yeah. <laughs> or, or folding proteins or whatnot. Not everybody does that because not everybody wants the, the performance impact on their computers, but some people just love that stuff. But you're kind of looking at it from the wrong angle. It's not about getting the goods to 100% utilization. It's allowing you to reach whatever your perception of 100% utilization is. So I mean, I'd get around, to go back to your server example, we, we, don't, I mean, we don't do Amazon, we deploy our app engine, Google's cloud, and as a result, no matter how far I want to scale, I can. You know, I can go to whatever my 100% is. So you as a car owner, to you, 100% utilization may never be driving someone else's car because you have a car that you love. For me, it's being able to you know, walk outside and drive that Nissan right there because that car looks cool. That's what 100% utilization is for me. And so essentially, it's just opening up a wide slew of choices for the consumer so the consumer can do basically whatever they want. But I think we're like really early days in this whole space. And like especially in Silicon Valley, it's like there aren't panels happening in like you know, middle America right now on this topic. We're definitely in a bubble here, and I think we have a lot of early adopters in our community here, um, but it's so early days that it's even hard to predict where consolidation might happen or what the future might hold because we're all kind of figuring it out. Uh, both very good questions. Um, so we haven't seen a lot, but obviously people get tickets. Um, the majority of our tickets have actually come from parking violations, um, especially for people like coming to the city and not, you know, not realizing, you know, what they're doing. We uh, currently we we deal with it by allowing owners to mail us a ticket, and then we deal with it. We're setting up a system that will actually monitor the owners' cars on our system, 
and without the owner needing to take any action, we'll move the ticket over to the responsible party. So right now we manually do it, but we're going, we're going to automate it very soon. What's that? No. Well, I mean, the, the, the city's helped to some extent. They give us open access to their APIs, to you know, the DMV's API lets us actually move these tickets around and things. But they, they're, not, they're not holding our hand. Um, what was the second part of your question? Fast track. Um, so fast track is something that the owner can add as an, like, an optional way to boost their car's you know, viability on the market. Their cars appeal to owners. But it's completely up to the owner, and we don't regulate it at all. We will handle the ticket um, if a fast track ticket comes in. But the owner can choose whether or not to leave their fast track in the car and whether or not to bill, you know, whether or not to just say to the renter, hey, you can do it. Or what a lot of people do is they say, you can use my fast track, but give me some money for it. Yeah, and in that case, we take care of it. So we transfer it over to the person who got the ticket. And you know, right now you have to mail it to you have to email it to us or mail it to us. But uh, very soon, it'll just all be automatic. I have a question. Like uh, um, you mentioned the analogy of cloud computing, and of course, a similar concept is a SaaS software as a service, where one provider is servicing many users, if you would, and each of your model has a little flavor of um, many to many or a small many to big many, all of these flavors. I just wanted to know what sort of like limiters of growth you have seen uh, while scaling up, and what do you see as key drivers for hyper growth in in this collaborative, uh, you know, consumption space. For us, we've had to get into things I never thought I would ever do. Um, for example. <laughs> um, we're building like a point of sale system right now for rental stores to use where we, we are sourcing hardware and distributing these point of sale packages on iPads with cash drawers and credit card swipers. I never thought I would get into that business, but it was required in order to really provide the service that we had to provide. Um, if this model is going to work, we had to do it. It was kind of like we could do it or not do it. We could have a business or we could not have a business. So we are doing it. And it's kind of neat because it opens up a lot of possibility for what we can provide to the end user through better technology. So this will sound trite, but I mean, simple product, 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 product. So the user experience on first touch, whether you're a supplier or a share, has to be easy to grok uh, and something that keeps you there and a degree of fun if you can. Uh, and then you want to really be conscious of the business model and, and, and be aware of what stage you're in and try to take friction out where you can, but still be on a track towards something that, that is a real business at scale. So, and then you get into the art that, and the secret sauce, but I, I'd say product first and then a, a real conscious sense of a business model. You have to be willing to do things to add resiliency. You know, when your supply is low, you don't have much resiliency as a business, you know, especially with us. You know, someone shows up at a car, and when we have five, you know, when we have five thousand cars in the city, it doesn't matter if the car's not there. There's another car a block away. When there's five cars in the city, it's tough. And so we, you know, as a business, you know, I'm not going to lie, we had we had that happen. And so we added resiliency by just making sure that if anyone showed up to a car, we would get them a cab, an Uber, whatever it was. We made sure that the, the user, as you, know, as you were talking to, the user experience was the number one thing that we were focusing on. And you know, we, we, you know, we, we, we worked harder and had higher costs to ensure that. But that's what we needed to build faith in the marketplace and the platform. Yeah, marketplaces are inherently marketplaces, right? So you're, it's not, there's not a 100% guarantee a transaction will take place. But uh, to build faith and trust in that marketplace, you do have to do things you wouldn't have ordinarily assumed that you would going into it <laughs> to, to try and ensure good experiences. I mean, the, the reason people come back to TaskRabbit is because if you post a job on TaskRabbit, there's an extraordinarily high likelihood that you're going to get that job done. Um, obviously, when you start in a market and there's five TaskRabbits, you have to do some things in the back end. You know, we'll go run ta we'll jo jobs ourselves. You know, we'll, we'll hire on-call TaskRabbits very early on just to get critical mass. Um, but then once you have hyper, uh, hyper liquidity in these little markets, uh, it takes care of itself. Yeah, I, uh, in the early days, I made a get around renter dinner at my house because they uh, showed up to a car near me and it wasn't there. Fortunately, they weren't in a rush. But uh, yeah, there's, <laughs> you got to do things sometimes. <laughs> so I, 
I, I wanted to get back to something that you said, uh, Victor, earlier. E each of you either has developed your own sort of platform in order to enable the kind of asset exchange that you're talking about, or else you're maybe, I, I, we haven't heard anything specifically about the platform that you use, so that'd be interesting to find out. And the, the reason why I bring that up is given something that you said earlier about this idea of having this sort of common platform that actually sort of lowers the barriers to, to people being able to make these kind of exchanges without necessarily having to go through the trouble of signing up. So basically, it sounded like you were saying, what if we all got together and kind of developed this sort of common platform so we could kind of really sort of move the needle in a significant way? I have two questions around that, especially since you're startups. Um, one, are you guys really bought into the idea of a common platform at this point? Because do you view your platform as kind of a main part of your value proposition in, in terms of your, your, your investors? And, and number two, assuming that that's not an issue for you and, and that eventually we do want to move toward the development of this common platform, who do you think would be the best entity to really sort of drive that, the creation of that common platform? To be clear, I don't think any of us have discussed the common platform before. This was oh, sort of like a brainstorm idea. That's why I'm bringing it up, because I yeah. thought it was an intriguing... Uh, I mean, I think in, in principle, there is a, a, a commonality of, of trust and safety and security that, that would be helpful for users that are coming onto all of these, uh, these platforms. You know, I, I know that um, you know, we're very willing to engage in, in, a, in, in a collaboration with other folks to, to do things that increase people's willingness to trust the, the members of a platform. But I'll let the other folks comment as well. I mean, get a, I, I've talked to the Airbnb guys, you know, quite a bit, especially after their, you know, big disaster about sharing information and stuff. But the answer is no. I mean, I'm not bought in to uh, shared information. And the reason is just there's too much at stake. You know, you renting a toaster 10 times or renting someone's house on Airbnb well doesn't necessarily mean you're a good driver or that, you know, I, I would trust you on my platform. And so I think, you know, it, it's, it's, it's good to get information on the back end and share information, but being able to create like just a shared, you know, collaborative consumption, you know, you're, you're, you're a good sharer is really hard because there's, there's facets to each platform and complications and, you know, things that make each platform unique that are very hard to standardize across with the wide range of, you know, essentially sharing everything. Okay, so chiming in, um, we, we built our own platform. So we are the system of record for the status and the availability of the assets in our platform. So that, that's all custom built. Um, and, the, and we're finding, and I think it would be the same across other asset types, the specific asset has lots of physical and operational characteristics that have to be reflected in the way you you know, carry the inventory. There are conditions to it that are dissimilar enough that I think it wouldn't make sense to try to put all types of assets into one platform, at least in the intermediate term. Where I think uh, Victor's comment earlier may have been more about was at this level of trust or at this level of sort of activity and reputation, there I'm, I can imagine it might be interesting for us to know what the usage activity of a potential user in our platform was on other platforms. There might be an affinity, if they're an active get-around user and an active task rabbit user, that might be interesting to our sharers, but it wouldn't obviate the need for us to do all of our own core trust and sort of transaction facilitation, if that makes sense. I, I think, just, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, just to be respectful of everybody's time, since it's 9.45, just two more questions, but go ahead. Um, we all share this idea of access. I, everyone up here is, building a company around access, and we've been working on the, these companies for, you know, three years, and it wasn't until, like, the last year that we've kind of been talking to each other. Like, this this movement around collaborative consumption, the sharing economy, has only really come into play in the last year. So this is, like, the first time where we're engaging and, and sharing best practices and seeing what's worked and what hasn't, but it also means that we all have, like, very different platforms. We, we have different ways of rating customers, we have different ways of leaving reviews. So like my thought is that our platforms aren't going to talk by themselves. Um, and if there were a kind of standard unifying system, which I do think is a good idea, I do think that there is value in your reputation following you or, through w your properties on the web. But if it's going to happen, I think it's going to take another startup, another company, another like entity that's really thinking of how do we integrate all these disparate sources because right now we have all these marketplaces that are totally different because we've all had to grow them on our own i mean to, to add one more thing 
I, I've, I've actually polled a lot of our customers about this. And one of the things that is always interesting to me is that, you know, I'm in the space, collaborative consumption. I know Airbnb and Arenzo. I don't have task grab it. But a lot of people, I would say the majority of people I talk to, did, really had no idea about the space of collaborative consumption. Many of our owners have no idea what Airbnb is. And so while it might be interesting to me how many times you, you know, you've shared an Airbnb versus how many times you've you know, shared something in Rensicle, to the, to the customer, to the consumer, they really don't know what that is. It's not relevant for information. I'll, I'll grab it just because we require Facebook for sign up at get around. Um, so yes, people are concerned about that. And yes, we do use Facebook data. It is a key part in you know building the marketplace and establishing trust and it's something that people have to get comfortable with. If you are not comfortable, there, there's you need a way of bringing of establishing trust in real life online in a much more accelerated way. And if you're not comfortable sharing some of your information, you won't gain entry to the, to the access economy. You just won't be able to establish trust. Yeah, we take our, I'm mean, sure this is true of everybody up here, we take our users' privacy very seriously. We don't share anything without the user's explicit permission. Um, you know, there's a feed of tasks that, that exist publicly, but that's because the user has allowed us to publish that task publicly. Uh, if a user's activity can be completely opaque, you know, to the point where you can obfuscate your membership of the platform if you want. Our privacy policy is published. We've not had people challenge it. Uh, we, we don't disclose it. Because we're marketplaces, we're sort of inherently, uh, there's a network effect built into all of our platforms. So uh, brand is less important than liquidity. Uh, once there's liquidity, you sort of have people using your marketplace and, and therefore people know like, oh, well, I'm, I'm task at that. Like for example, when somebody wants to uh, sell or buy, say a watch, I'm sure that there are watch specific auction houses online out there, but your first inclination is, oh, I'm gonna go to eBay. Uh, you know, there's, there's brand associated with the liquidity in your particular marketplace. Your execution determines your brand. I mean, like, I, I, like GetAround uses TaskRabbit. I don't actually know if there are any TaskRabbit competitors because TaskRabbit does it well, and so I use them. The way you build customer loyalty, as you, know, you said earlier, things spread through word of mouth, through PR. And what generates word of mouth and PR? Excellence and execution. And so that's really how you develop your brand. You know, so. Concur, and, and uh, as Victor said earlier, Storytelling is really important. So, so storytelling as a core strategy of your PR, and then I think you have the opportunity to maybe do some op, do, do some deals or some scenarios which may not be massive in their immediate scale for you, but they make for additional interesting stories that capture people's attention. I mean, City of Palo Alto just launched the downtown, the new downtown library in liquid space, and 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 we think that's really exciting in the long term about you know liquidating or liquefying the massive amount of government space. But, but more importantly, it captures people's attention as an interesting story with good execution. I agree, because you know, with renting, it's an $85 billion industry. It's been around for hundreds of years. But a lot of people don't even realize what they can rent. Like, I, I wrote a blog when I, I rented my Christmas tree. It was like a living Christmas tree. It was delivered to me. It was awesome. I decorated it. And then they took it back, and it, they replanted it. So like, it was really it was <laughs> crazy. <laughs> Like, most people don't know you could do that kind of stuff. And it is important to educate and tell those stories because we're kind of trying to revive this activity that's been around for hundreds of years and breathe new life into it. 
and the brand has to be more about the experience that you get from renting these products, less about the utility of these products and more the experience that they bring. And we're challenging ourselves uh, in 2012 to kind of be more in tune with that and make sure that our brand is delivering on that. I, I got I got it two years in a row. It was like two feet larger. It was a uh, sequoia, actually. <laughs> I wanted, one comment about um, the shared platform um, question is that um, there is I'm, I'm not working for this company, but there is a company called Rapleaf that I think should probably be providing the reputation, and I think that's kind of how they got started before they had to change their business model to do other things. Um, so maybe someone should talk to Aaron Hoffman about uh, doing some good stuff with his data. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask, if you don't mind sharing your um, marketing strategy, how do you scale from being a local, very locally focused business to growing to a country level and maybe even globally? Um, I'm, I'm really curious about that. Thank you. Um, stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we don't know yet, but um, what we're planning to do is treat, is, is not change the scale at which we operate. So we operate on a, on, a, on a distinct cluster level. We build supply, we build we build demand, we have specific things we do, street teaming, drop shipping. You know, we're essentially figuring out a formula that can work in any market. And then there are differentiators in the market that are unique things that you have to plug into the formula, but the trick is not changing the level at scale at which we operate. We always will be launching clusters of cars where the supply and demand ratio is a certain way. I, I think it's right. Like You just have to find the model that works first. I mean, to speak for RentCycle, we are only in the San Francisco Bay Area. Like We've only been here for a year and a half, and we haven't expanded beyond. And we don't have plans to expand beyond until we really make it work here. Um, I've had conversations with other marketplaces that have the same story, like ZocDoc, where you can book doctor's appointments online. I was just talking to that founder, and he said he was in New York for basically three years before they moved into another market. After they got it right in New York, they expanded to 14 markets in you know, 18 months. So it happened really quickly. But until you get that like perfect formula where you know how to get supply, you know how to quickly match it with demand, an investor isn't going to put money into a model until you prove it works. So at least rent cycle is still in the proving it works phase. We launched in the Bay Area. Our emphasis was in the Bay Area. So you'll find that the greatest amount of our supply is in the Bay Area. But we've also got about 30% of our supply, which is scattered across the US with other points of, of clustering. Um, we're just about to begin an emphasis on a second major metro area um, on the East Coast. Uh, to, pl to run the playbook that we've learned worked here. Where it's a hybrid for us is that we've also made joining the marketplace as a supplier or a user completely self-provisioning. So we don't regulate. So if you want to list your workspace in Alaska or in you know, middle Iowa, you, you can, and people do. Uh, the challenge for us, though, is, is living up to the pledge and the promise of the offering then. So you know, you're showing up and there's not supply. That, that's a challenge. So we're, we're feeling our way through that. Our sense is that... Uh, and, and Airbnb did it this way. They, you know, they were in New York and San Francisco principally when they were trumpeting that they were global. Right? The reality was the playbook they were running was concentrated in those two communities. Yet, they allowed the floodgates to open everywhere. So um, check back in with us in another year. There's two parts to your question. One is how do you operationally scale? And, and I would sort of define that as how do you create supply? And then how do you raise awareness? And what's your marketing effectiveness? And that's how you generate demand. Um, and I think we're all developing a lot of secret sauce on how you develop supply in new markets, because that's what's going to generate liquidity on the opposite side. The awareness piece is where the storytelling comes in and the word of mouth. And so if you look at how, within a local market, how all of our businesses will scale, it's you start within these pockets of very high liquidity. They have you, you are absolutely amazing at execution. The way Avery talks about you build tremendous word of mouth, and it starts to expand virally and you start to see going from the mission district in San Francisco uh, to six months down the road, you see people renting cars in Menlo Park. So your efforts can be uh, more effective if you focus on those pockets of initial high liquidity so that it can spread from those areas. So instead of trying to launch in you know, Fargo, uh, why don't we try and launch in the very high geographic um, uh, the concentration areas that are nearby so that it can spread more organically? 
956? Um, Pretty good. Uh, so I uh, wanted to thank everybody once again. Our great panelists have shared so much with us and you guys. So once again, just a round of applause.